Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're taking another look at the Core i5-10400, but this time the more affordable F variant. Though in terms of performance they are essentially the same thing, the 10400F just drops the integrated UHD graphics 630, which really isn't an issue for gamers looking to pair the CPU with a discrete graphics card. So since I've already reviewed the Core i5-10400F, we won't be doing that all over again. Rather I want to see how this processor performs when paired with a new current generation high-end GPU, in this case the Radeon RX 6800. Recently I compared the Ryzen 5 3600 to high-end flagship CPUs such as the Ryzen 9 3950X and Core i9 10900K in a wide range of games using the RX 6800 and found for the most part there was very little performance difference at 1440p so the budget Ryzen 5 part did very well. However I also noted that for those of you looking to upgrade or build a new PC in early 2021, right now the Ryzen 5 3600 isn't really a great deal. The Ryzen 5 processor was released 18 months ago now at $200 US back in July 2019. By early 2020 it could be had for as little as $150 US. Today though it's back up at the $200 US MSRP, sometimes even a little bit higher. That being the case, 18 months on, it's no longer a good value buy, or at least that's how it appears, especially when parts like the Core i5-10400F can be had for just $166 US. And this is an interesting role reversal because eight months ago when I reviewed the 10400, the Intel CPU was coming in at $195 US, while the Ryzen 5 processor cost more like $175 US. Though I should note at the time the 10400F wasn't actually available, but still that part's only about $10 cheaper than the non-F version. Also back then, Z490 motherboards were quite costly while decent B450 boards were relatively inexpensive, and that in my opinion made the Ryzen 5 part the better value deal at the time. In fact, I concluded the 10400 review by saying the following. If the Ryzen 5 3600 remains at $175 US, which at this point it seems set to do, then Intel will need to drop the 10400F down to $150 US for me to consider recommending it. And of course, B460 boards will have to prove their worth as well, and opening up memory overclocking there would certainly help Intel's case. This really is something they absolutely need to do at this point. So essentially what I was saying was, the Intel CPU needs to be about 15% cheaper for it to be my preferred choice of these two options. And guess what? Today it's about 17% cheaper. There is of course a lot more to this comparison, and I'll discuss all of the pros and cons towards the end of the video. For now, let's see how the 10400F handles the RX 6800, and how that performance compares to the R5 3600 along with the high-end parts such as the 10900K. We're going to look at performance in 20 games at 1080p, 1440p and 4K using 32GB of DDR4 3200CL14 memory. And I am aware that on more affordable B series boards, the 10400F will be limited to DDR4 2666. But for the sake of this comparison, I wanted to keep the test hardware as apples to apples as possible. So please note, for DDR4 3200 or faster, you will require a Z490 motherboard. Previously, I found that DDR4 3200 offers up to a 10% performance uplift over the 2666 memory with Intel CPUs, and the average performance uplift is about half that. So with that in mind, let's jump into the benchmark graphs. Starting with the Godfall results, we find that the 10400F is up to 15% faster than the R5 3600 at 1080p when comparing the average frame rate, though only 4% faster when comparing the 1% low data. The margin is reduced slightly at 1440p, here the 10400F was 12% faster, delivering 10900K light performance under these more GPU limited test conditions. Then at 4K we're looking at identical performance across the board. Next up we have Watch Dogs Legion, and here the 10400F is roughly on par with the R5 3600, and that meant it was just 9% slower than the 10900K at 1080p, while it was able to match it at 1440p and 4K. So under realistic gaming conditions, which would see you play at 1440p or higher, the 10400F is able to get the most out of the RX 6800. Performance in Dirt 5 is again similar between the 10400F and 3600 both delivering similar performance to the flagship CPUs at 1080p and then identical performance at 1440p and 4K. 
The 10400F also delivered comparable average frame rate performance in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, though with a hit to 1% low performance, but the game still appeared to run very smoothly. Still, it is a little concerning to see a 13% reduction in 1% low performance at 1440p when compared to the Ryzen 5 3600. The Core i5-10400F did perform very well in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, delivering comparable performance to the R5 3600, and while that meant the 1% low performance was well down on the 10900K at 1080p, performance was comparable at the more GPU-limited 1440p resolution. The 10400F performed very well in Cyberpunk 2077, delivering performance very near to that of the 10900K, even at 1080p, though so did the R5 3600. Still, the 10400F was slightly better at 1080p and 1440p, and while you won't notice the difference, it was still faster. Now, for those of you seeking maximum performance at 1080p, the 10400F does fall short, though I have to question how important the difference between the Core i5 and Ryzen 5 processors are here, given we're at well over 300 FPS for the most part. Then at 1440p, the performance margins are neutralized and the CPU becomes somewhat irrelevant. Again, we see another title where the 10400F lags behind just a little bit at 1080p, but we're talking about almost 300 FPS on average with a 1% low of almost 200 FPS. So again, I have to question how much this difference matters for most gamers. Then we're seeing a very little difference at 1440p and no difference at 4K. Moving on to F1 2020, and here we see very little difference in performance between all four tested CPUs. The 10400F matched the 3950X at 1080p, making it just 5% faster than the 3600. But again, with average frame rates up over 200 FPS, there's little to be gained by a 5% boost. The margins at 1440p are much the same, shrinking ever so slightly. And then at 4K, we're looking at identical results as the game becomes entirely GPU bound. The 10400F is very similar to the R5 3600 and Horizon Zero Dawn, making it just 6% slower than the 10900K at 1080p and 5% slower at 1440p. For the most part, you're getting very close to the max out of the RX 6800 with the Core i5 processor in this title. Here we have yet another example where the 10400F isn't a great deal slower than the 10900K and is comparable to the R5 3600, this time in Red Dead Redemption 2. Moving on to the World War Z results, where we do see a slight reduction in performance with the Core i5 processor, though it was comparable to the R5 3600, making it 10% slower than the 10900K at 1080p. As I've found in the past, Resident Evil 3 isn't at all CPU intensive, and as a result, performance is very similar using all four test CPUs. Basically, the 10400F is no slower than the 10900K, and is therefore able to extract the maximum performance from the RX 6800. Doom Eternal is another game that isn't particularly CPU intensive, and as a result, the 10400F and 3600 are very evenly matched, trailing the 10900K by just an 8% margin at 1080p, and 6% at 1440p. The Core i5-10400F scales better in Death Stranding than the R5 3600, delivering 18% more performance at 1080p, and that's a significant performance uplift. That said, the margin is reduced to just 2% at 1440p, and then we see no performance difference at 4K. The 10400F also performs much better than the R5 3600 and Hitman 2, delivering 16% more performance at 1080p and up to 14% more at 1440p when comparing the 1% low results. Unexpectedly, the Core i5-10400F falls away a little bit in War Thunder, and this is seen even at 1440p where it was 6% slower than the Ryzen 5 3600. Not a terrible result, but certainly weaker than expected given many of the other games that we've already looked at. Here we're seeing that the 10400F does perform very well in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, trailing the 10900K by only a very slim margin. It was also 6% faster than the R5 3600 at 1080p, then 4% at 1440p, while they came together at 4K. Frame rates are also very similar in Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. The 10400F does trail a little at 1080p, particularly when looking at the 1% low data, but that difference is made up once we become GPU bound at 1440p. Then finally, we have Gears 5, and here the 10400F is very similar to the 10900K at 1080p. And then by the time we reach 1440p, all four CPUs are seen delivering the exact same level of performance. So it doesn't really matter which of these four CPUs you're using in Gears 5, with the RX 6800, performance is going to be much the same. Okay, so that's a look at all 20 games. As expected, the Core i5-10400F performed very well. 
seem to be pretty well on par with the Ryzen 5 3600. A little bit faster in some games, a little bit slower in others, but generally I think it did come out pretty even. But of course, we will look at the 20 game average and that'll tell us exactly how these two processors stack up across a wide range of games. No real surprises here, the 10400F and 3600 are very evenly matched with the Radeon GPU, both delivering around the same level of performance with the RX 6800 at 1080p, 1440p and 4K. Then compared to the 10900K, they're only around 9% slower at 1080p, and then 4% slower at 1440p with no real difference at 4K. The low latency DDR4-3200 dual rank memory is likely helping out the 3600 a little bit more than maybe the 10400F, but either way, they are very close overall in terms of gaming performance. So there you have it, the Core i5-10400F is still a very capable gaming CPU and certainly an excellent value pairing for a high-end GPU such as the Radeon RX 6800. When compared to the Ryzen 5 3600, there is very little in it, just as we saw many months ago when first reviewing the Core i5 part. Now, because the 10400 and 3600 were so evenly matched in my Core i5 review, I ended up recommending the Ryzen CPU, and I did so for a few reasons. Firstly, the 3600 was cheaper, around 10% cheaper, which admittedly that doesn't really seem like a big deal when you say it, 10%, but uh, you couple that saving with the cheaper B450 motherboards at the time, and the Ryzen 5 package ended up costing a decent amount less. The Ryzen 5 3600 on a B450 or newer motherboard also has a strong upgrade path. Not only can you upgrade to an 8, 12 or 16 core Zen 2 processor, but now you have the option of a much higher IPC Zen 3 processor as well, again scaling all the way up to 16 cores. The 3600 is also typically a bit punchier in applications, so another plus there for those of you not just gaming. On the other hand, the Core i5-10400F will require a Z series motherboard, so a Z490 motherboard, for maximum performance as the B and H series boards will limit you to DDR4-2666. Though realistically, that's not a huge deal breaker, as gaming performance for the most part will be much the same as you're more than likely going to end up being GPU limited. Especially those of you gaming at 1440p or higher with something like a Radeon RX 6800, as we just saw. Still, unless you have a Z series motherboard, memory and CPU overclocking is off the table. Though CPU overclocking is off the table anyway, unless you have a K SKU processor, so probably shouldn't have brought that up. Point is, you can overclock the R5 3600 and its DDR4 memory on any of AMD's B and X series motherboards. Now, the cheapest Z490 motherboard that I'd bother with is the MSI Z490-A Pro at $160 US. And that's not terrible, but for less, you can get a much higher quality B550 motherboard, such as the MSI B550 Gaming Plus or ASUS Tough Gaming B550 Plus. Both cost around $150 US. The MSI B550 M Bazooka is also great value at $130. So I guess my point is there are a number of high quality, affordable AM4 motherboards to choose from. So with the AM4 motherboards being up to $30 cheaper, you will end up paying a similar amount for a Ryzen 5 3600 on a B550 board as you will a Core i5-10400F on a Z490 motherboard. At least assuming pricing in your region is similar to what we're seeing in the US at retailers such as Newegg.com. And it is a similar situation here in Australia. Over at PC Case Gear, the Intel combo will save you about $30, which works out to be a negligible 6% discount. At the end of the day, once you factor in the cost of the motherboard, both options really do end up costing roughly the same amount. You could save a bit more money by getting an Intel B460 motherboard and opting for lower clocked memory, but really you can also do the same with the Ryzen CPU by buying something like an A520 or an even cheaper B450 motherboard. I have to admit, when I initially saw the discounted Core i5-10400F, I thought it would quite clearly be the better value option, but after a complete analysis, it turns out that at best it's offering the same level of value as the Ryzen 5 3600, which is now back up at its current launch price. The 3600 does benefit from a superior upgrade path. It does support technology such as PCI Express 4.0, and it does support overclocking on all B and X series motherboards. So ultimately, I think it is still the better value choice. I just find it hard to recommend it at $200 US, when not that long ago, it was down as low as $150 US. But I guess that is the world we live in right now. 
Given the new pricing that sees Intel now cheaper than AMD, I feel parts like the Core i5-10400F are certainly a viable alternative, and if available or pricing of the Zen 2 processors is even worse in your region, then I wouldn't hesitate to snap up the Core i5. As you've just seen, it's certainly a very capable processor. Sadly though, while you can easily snap up a part like the 10400F, getting your hands on an RX 6800 series graphics card is near enough to impossible, and getting one at a reasonable price does appear to be impossible. So that really does suck, but all we can do is hope the situation improves soon. And with that, I'm gonna end this video. If you liked it, you know what to do. You can also subscribe for more content because, you know, we do these benchmarks from time to time, so there may be more you wanna see. Actually, on that note, a lot of you in the last video, which looked at the Ryzen 5 3600, there were a lot of requests for the same comparison with the Ryzen 5 5600X. So maybe I can add that to this data set with the 3600 and the 10400F. So that could be quite interesting. So yeah, if you really wanna see the 5600X, let me know about it in the comment section below. And hopefully in a week or so, I can uh, make that video for you guys. Should be quite interesting, I think. Uh, otherwise, we have our Harbour Unbox community, our official Harbour Unbox community, which you can join over at Floatplane or Patreon. That will get you access to our monthly live streams. They come up towards the end of the month. Tim and myself get together and do that for the Floatplane and Patreon members. We also have an exclusive Discord chat. We also do Q and A's, behind the scenes videos, a lot of cool stuff there. So if you are interested, check that out. Or check that out. The links are in the video description, top of the video description. If you're interested, check it out. If not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.